times, you will lose weight. Your insulin action in your body will improve. So it's really important that you're obstructively at be treated appropriately, and that helps with your whole metabolic status. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about thyroid, and then I'll just open it up to questions. Uh huh. Can we go back? The machine and diabetes. Yeah, okay. So, um, let's just talk really quickly about how diabetes starts and progresses. So, for most people, you're not going to develop type 1 diabetes, where, which is where your immune system attacks your pancreas. It does happen in older individuals, but it's very uncommon. It usually happens in young persons, and we used to call it juvenile diabetes because of that. Type 2 diabetes is that central fat accumulation right here around the middle. Once you accumulate that fat, it makes angry chemicals. Those angry chemicals that come from the fat tell your body to not use insulin well. Okay? So that angry, noxious environment because of those chemicals that that fat cat is making make your body not use insulin well. So the next step is your pancreas goes into stress mode and it's jogging in place trying to make more and more and more and more insulin to overcome the fact that your body's not using insulin well. So you need to make more of it. The bad aspect about that part of the progression of diabetes is then that increased insulin levels continue to make you hungry and gain weight and deposit it right around the middle. So it's like this self-fulfilling thing. So the pancreas is working hard, 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 hard to make more insulin to overcome the fact that your body's not using it well because the fat's not allowing the body to use it well because of these angry chemicals. And eventually the pancreas poops out. It poops out because it's worked too hard. That's the point at which type 2 diabetics go on insulin therapy. Okay? Now what happens when you have obstructive sleep apnea? and your oxygen levels go down at night, and your carbon dioxide levels go high, is that that also causes inflammation. And it tricks your brain into feeling like it's in a panic mode. Your whole body goes into a panic mode because you're not breathing well in the middle of the night. That makes insulin function even less in somebody who's got prediabetes or diabetes. So if you can get better ventilation, better breathing at night because you have a good fitting mask and you're not waking up a thousand times and you're not desaturating in the middle of the night a thousand times, inflammation from that goes down and your own body's insulin works better. Okay, so that is a key. I have patients in whom I diagnose, diagnose obstructive sleep apnea that are already on insulin therapy. And when I get their obstructive sleep apnea under control, I can cut their insulin by 25 or 50 percent. Wow. That's how potent it is. So that has to be treated. Wow. Um, the other thing is, for our gentlemen with obstructive sleep apnea, when you have obstructive sleep apnea, your testosterone goes low. When you treat your obstructive sleep apnea, your body's natural, it naturally recovers testosterone production. So there's another hormonal relationship there. And then I guess the last thing we'll talk about is thyroid. So um, can folks think of the different types of thyroid disease that there are? Just hypo name some. Hyper. Hypo, so what does that mean, hypo and hyper? Those are fancy terms. Hypo is you, you're not producing enough. Um, right. Thyroid. Thyroid. Thyroid hormone. Right. And hyper, you're producing too much. Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So what do you think? You want to talk about the symptoms? Yeah, yeah, we can talk about the symptoms. This one, this one had hyper, that one had hypo. Okay, so that's a good point. <laughs> Thyroid disease runs in families. Just like lung diseases, it's way more common in women. When it runs in families, one can be overactive and one can be underactive. And you can even switch being from underactive to overactive can be very complicated. We've had three under and me high. Okay. So the, if anybody in your family or you have hypothyroidism, then your family members are more likely, and especially the women in your family. Okay. Does that carry down to the children also? Yes. Carries down to the children as well and is more common in the women. So, the, so I will tell you that <coughs> hypothyroidism certainly exists 
less than 10% in the population, but it may be as common as 10%. What do you think it is in, when I went to the PHA meeting and started asking women if they had thyroid disease, what do you think the rates were? 75 real percent. Mm -hmm. So probably because all lung diseases have some autoimmune basis, which is where your immune system gets confused and attacks the lung, that is the most prominent reason for having thyroid disease, is that your immune system fought off a virus, then got confused and thought the thyroid tissue looked like a virus. Okay? And there's a genetic predisposition for those things. All right? So there is some relationship that we don't fully understand. Um, and let's talk about what treating thyroid does. So if you have really low thyroid hormone, the major symptoms are difficulty to lose weight, feeling cold all the time, feeling constipated, losing your hair, dry skin, swelling of the lower legs, increasing your tongue size, fatigue. So those are the major symptoms of hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism, where you have too much thyroid production, is jitteriness, losing weight, um, feeling hot all the time, irritability. irritability, having a high heart rate or pulse rate, having high blood pressure. So if I give a person who is hypothyroid, thyroid hormone back, they will breathe better because there are receptors on the respiratory muscles for thyroid hormone. So if somebody rolls in in my ICU and has undetectable thyroid, maybe somebody who's homeless who's been off their thyroid hormone for months or whatever, they don't breathe much. Shallow breathing, they don't oxygenate well. So we know that respiratory muscles are optimized when your thyroid hormone is normal, okay? And you need that. And conversely, if your body makes too much thyroid hormone, it drives heart rate really fast, doesn't allow the heart to fill properly, which antagonizes what goes on with the heart when you have end-stage lung disease. And it causes pulmonary hypertension for some reason we do not understand. <coughs> Graves patients are the most common, okay? And Graves patients have autoimmune thyroid disease as well. It's just that their immune system, when it attacks the thyroid, doesn't make the thyroid poop out. It makes the thyroid become overactive. And patients with Graves disease often have other manifestations. Think Barney Fife when you think of Graves disease. The prominent eyes, the tremor, they can have rashes, they can have extensive bone pain. And so we don't understand it, but when I diagnose a patient who has really severe hyperthyroidism from Graves' disease, if I do an echo to estimate the pressures in their lungs, they'll often be high, and once we get their thyroid back down to the normal range, that pulmonary hypertension will improve. So it's really the only form of pulmonary hypertension that improves spontaneously and well with treatment of an underlying disorder. So I guess the take home message is that most lung diseases are driven by a confused immune system. Almost all thyroid diseases are mediated by a confused immune system. And so the two coexist. And then there is one last category. Do any of you guys have really severe lung disease and are on medications called prostacyclins. So if any of you guys ever got sick enough and you were candidate, candidates for medications called prostacyclins, we know that prostacyclins interfere with thyroid hormone production and can make you hypothyroid over time and can cause the development of thyroid nodules. So that's a special class of patients in whom we screen. Um, for thyroid disease. What is prostacyclin? Prostacyclin mm -hmm. is used to dilate the blood vessels in the lung. And you can do... Just in the lung? Yep, you can do continued infusions. Anybody heard of the drugs Flolan? We don't have any folks with... Okay, so the, those drugs that are used for really end-stage lung disease, that are administered sometimes by indwelling catheter in your body, cause thyroid function disruption. 
So it is important that you all get screened for hypothyroidism. It is important that you be checked regularly to make sure that the thyroid hormone levels are at goal. If we get your thyroid hormone levels at goal in your hypothyroidism, the muscles that you use to breathe will be stronger. If you have overactive hypothyroidism and we get it under control, the right heart will work better. Okay. So what other questions do you have about thyroid? How do you uh, test for that? Is that uh, blood on a standard panel? Yep, it's blood on a standard panel. And the, the best screening tools for thyroid are first of all physical exam. If I look at somebody across the room and they've got a big goiter right here, the thyroid sits in the neck right here like a little butterfly with two lobes and a little strap of tissue in between. If I look across the room and somebody's got an enlarged goiter, they either live in an iodine deficient country because the thyroid uses, the thyroid must have ready access to iodine to make thyroid hormones. So in countries where you see people with big goiters because they don't have iodized salt in their diet, right? We all get plenty of iodine in most cases. So if I see a big goiter, then that's somebody who probably needs to be screened for thyroid disease. If I have somebody, a woman, who's had a lot of miscarriages in her young adult years, she needs to be screened because hypothyroidism can also cause infertility in the first trimester miscarriages. If there's somebody with a family history of thyroid disease, then I'm gonna check. And in most of my patients, they come to me because there's a clinical suspicion they have thyroid disease or they have family history. And so after the physical exam, finding out the family history and their reproductive history, I measure something called a TSH. And basically, in your brain, you have a little organ called the pituitary. It sits right back here behind your eyes. It's the master switch to control all, most of your important hormones, okay? And so your thyroid is down here in your neck like a little bow tie. And if the thyroid hormone starts to, thyroid gland starts to poop out, and it's not making enough thyroid hormone, which we usually measure in the form of something called the free T4, if the brain senses that the thyroid is sluggish, it sends down something called thyroid stimulating hormone to try to make the gland work harder. So the brain is always trying to decide whether the thyroid, thyroid's work, working sufficiently. So the normal range for TSH is between 5.5 and 5.0. So if someone comes into my clinic and they've got an elevated TSH, then that tells me that their brain thinks their thyroid's not working hard enough. Conversely, if the TSH is very low, and this is kind of confusing, but if the TSH is very low, then the, thyroid, the brain's like, whoa, the thyroid's in overactive. And so then I will follow that up with a free T4. So those are the best tests. And then there are some specific antibody tests, one called thyroid peroxidase antibody, or TPO, which is an antibody that I will screen in patients who have a goiter, and who have family history because it is a marker of autoimmunity. You, even though you have two different forms of thyroid disease, you are probably both TPO antibody positive, if I were to check, okay? So that's the way you check. And it really should be checked frequently. And when you're on thyroid hormone, we usually make adjustments about every three months. And for most of you, the goal of the TSH is between one and three. So we get your medical therapy to get you to a TSH of about that range. Now, when you go on steroids or you get really sick, the thyroid labs can be unreliable. 